If you want to eat as good as my chickens, you'll just have to eat my chickens. <laughs> Use toilet paper. <laughs> Meet Jimmy Carter. Now you don't need toilet paper either. My chickens fly more non stops to New York than any other birds. I'm Frank. Try me. Oh, hi, Janie. How are you? Well, I never felt better since I stopped using toilet paper. In 1974, more than $26 billion was spent on advertising in America. That was an all-time record, and the figures for 1975 and this year will be even higher. But isn't there meant to be a recession, a crisis of confidence in the great supermarket of the West, with whole cities devastated by unemployment? Yes, of course. But the heart and soul of America is the hard sell, the advertising man's ability to persuade people to buy the things they don't need. And it can be truly said that Madison Avenue, the center of the advertising industry, has risen to the challenge of these hard times by packaging, promoting, and selling with a determination that the late John D. Rockefeller or Henry Ford would have admired. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, say the words in the Statue of Liberty. These days, the inscription might read, give me your pre-moistened toilet tissues clinically tested for flushability. Give me your rabbi-approved Hebrew national hot dog. Give me your Frank Perdue chickens. It takes a tough man to make a tender chicken. And above all, give me your tired, huddled politicians yearning to be president or governor or dog catcher. Just give me anything and I'll sell it. Government regulations say we can make our Hebrew national beef hot dogs from frozen beef. We don't. The government says we can use artificial coloring. We don't. They say we can add meat byproducts. We don't. They say we can add non-meat fillers. We can't. We're kosher and have to answer to an even higher authority. There were some skeptics on Madison Avenue who said that the American public would never swallow a Hebrew national hot dog. Of course, they didn't reckon on Scally McCabe Sloves, who, in their own words, are the now, now, now advertising agency of America. Founded just nine years ago, they can afford these days to turn down accounts of less than three quarters of a million dollars. Thanks to them, more American bathroom smell of airwick, more caffeine-free coffee is drunk, more faces wear face cream, more drivers drive Volvos. And even Colonel Sanders is beginning to worry about Frank Perdue, that tough guy with the tender chickens. I don't care. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. The ad, it's up to me to make the ad right. I don't care where the changes come from. But now Scully McCabe's sloves face their greatest challenge. Can they change America's oldest habit? Can they enter the last forbidden area and return triumphant? Can they sell the ultimate in the unnecessary? Can they sell freshen? Well, I'm mixing them now. But they were all Better late than never, kiddo. I was just looking at this, the freshen projects. Now, that seems to be an amazing, slightly amazing campaign. It is campaign. an amazing campaign. You're selling something we're selling... to replace toilet paper. Well, we're not selling it to replace toilet paper, dry toilet paper as we know it, because you really can't tell people how to, how to take care of themselves. You can introduce it as a new concept in bathroom care, but you can't say to them, throw out your old dry paper. I mean, you know, it's like saying throw out your mother, mm -hmm. because it's, you've been brought up with it. Um, it's, been a, it's a historical fact what, of what life. Is, what is fresh? In can you describe it? Freshen is God's answer to um, anal problems. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, my. This is the replacement of toilet paper, freshen. You see. I see it's... Uh, it cleans better, it's flushable, and it's biodegradable. How, how does it... Stu, could you show me how it actually works? Sure. Comes in a dispenser. Mm -hmm. And inside, you've got, uh, 
works better than this. <laughs> yeah. You've got your, your refill tissues. Yeah. Which are, as it says, pre moistened. The premise of the product is to uh, wet cleans better than dry in its most simple terms. So, what you're saying is that all these years, people who have been using dry toilet paper have really not been getting full satisfaction from the product. This is very exciting. I mean, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're changing uh, a great American habit, and that's uh, toilet paper, mm -hmm. um, to, to something that's completely different. It's like taking wheels off cars, you know. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we sort of like say it's like putting wheels on. Oh, wheels on cars, I'm sorry, of course. We developed some marvelous commercials. Actually, Ed McCabe and Sam Scally did them. They were just fantastic. They were vignettes of people in unexpected situations, for example. They don't use toilet paper. My daddy doesn't use toilet paper. And neither do I. Now, you don't need toilet paper either. Introducing Freshen, the new pre-moistened toilet tissue that gets you cleaner than ordinary toilet tissue can. Freshen isn't dry. It's lightly moistened to get you cleaner. And the cleaner you are, the better you feel. I've never played better since I stopped using toilet paper. So, is it necessary? If clean, to be clean is necessary, this product is necessary to be clean. And uh, that's what we're out to convince people of. And uh, cleanliness has always been an issue in this country. Uh, we are sometimes thought of being a little bit <clears throat> hyped on uh, all the cleaning products we have. Clean freaks. Clean freaks, yes. And uh, uh, you would think that this would be an automatic shoe-in based on that, but we still have to jump over these psychological hurdles of repression of the anal area, which are here and I suppose out everywhere in the world, but pr very deeply yeah. ingrained here. Would you say this was the last forbidden area of advertising? Yeah, somebody said every other orifice of the body has been made public except this one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now we're working on this one. We have a woman in her bathroom. She's a marvelous woman. We, it took us ages to cast her because she had to be just right. A little bit of the toughness, but a little bit of the understanding. We wanted her to imply that she had a family. She had to have humor and personality. And she had to really look like all those other women out there. So um, she says, um, when I first saw fresh and moist toilet paper on TV, I said, nothing doing. After 35 years, I'm not throwing out my dry toilet paper. So I didn't. But I sure found out fresh and can do what dry can't do. And then she does a little demonstration. And What's the demonstration? She, <laughs> it's not what you think it is. <laughs> This is Marvin Sloves, the senior partner. And this is one of the Now 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 agency's two trophy rooms, filled with an assortment of prizes, which Madison Avenue awards itself almost every time a client's profits grow. Most of them here were won by copywriter Ed McCabe, the wonder boy who wrote the words that sell Hebrew hot dogs and wet toilet paper. Ed has a place all of his own in Madison Avenue's Hall of Fame. Take fresh and your campaign says that it makes you cleaner, but all these years we've all felt all right with toilet paper, I would imagine. But what? Well, you've never that, had a choice. Yeah, that's, that's also the problem. You're just all right. This, this happens to be a superior product. And that's right. There will be a lot of people who will never, ever buy it. But they won't buy it for the wrong reason. They're not going to buy it because they have such an ingrained habit of using dry toilet paper that they don't even want to think about anything else. And they think they're clean enough. The problem is that this does work better. And it is a superior product. And uh, that's all we're trying to tell people, that it is a new, improved way of doing something. Don't people buy, a lot of people buy for the packaging, and that's why so much money is spent on packaging. And in fact, because of the advertising, forgetting the substance of the advertising, the slickness of a commercial, the, the, uh, your talents, you write the that, copy and so on, surely. I can get away with that once. If I do something very slick and they go and buy it for that reason, which is a very superficial reason, and the product doesn't deliver in some way, uh, in, in a functional or usable way, they won't buy it again. Yeah. Uh, and, and if they do, it's asking an awful lot for me or yeah. people in advertising to say, well, we're not going to give it to them. Is it fair in the midst of a recession with up to nine million people in this country out of work for, let me say, advertising generally to give 
the American people with, as I say, 8 million or 9 million unemployed, a product that some people might think was not necessary? Oh, I'd love to answer that. Some people may think a product is unnecessary. Another person may think it's very necessary. I don't think it's anyone's place to tell people what they need. And I think the success of our system is you offer them something. If they want it, they buy it. If it's terrible, they won't buy it. They make or break products in the marketplace. And I don't think our job is to be a censor on what the American public should have. I think, sure, if something's dangerous or hazardous and they put their hand in it and their hand falls off or something, then, then you exercise that kind of judgment. But uh, uh, whether or not a product is valid or not, I don't think uh, uh, is necessarily right for us to make that decision. Let me put it this way. What would you not sell, Martin? Personally, you mean, as, as a company or me personally? As, as, well, yes. I wouldn't sell any politician that. that my partners didn't concur in his political beliefs. And I wouldn't expect anyone with this agency to work on any political campaign that they didn't believe the person they were working for or the cause was a just and fair one. Yeah. And I'm not sure it's really fair that agencies should be involved with, with selling politicians mm -hmm. because I do think that it, it can come down to a case of a good agency versus a bad agency. And to me, that's potentially a very dangerous thing. Because I think you can package, like we saw with Nixon, sure. you can package a, a, a politician and make him palatable to people. I think it becomes a very dangerous area. And there's another example. It's called Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Where he's is got, he positioned? He, is, is he, he, pos he put himself right into a box. Yeah. And he's going to, he, he, he did it all, but he had it. It's like, you know, it's like being, you're having distribution in every supermarket. The whole world is waiting. And then you open up the box, and it turns out there's nothing in it. When you advertise a politician and someone buys the product you're selling, that they've had it. Right. Because four years with a bad product in the White House is a, is a disaster. Mm -hmm. With a tube of toothpaste that doesn't taste good, they can switch to another brand, and it's not the end of their life in the, in the world. This year, more than $300 million will be spent on the choosing of an American president. And half of this will go to advertising agencies and to image makers who specialize in the selling of politicians. The importance of image makers was first noticed during the 1968 presidential campaign when a group of very clever advertising men set out to sell a new product called the new Richard Nixon. Using techniques they would normally use to sell a packet of nut crunchies, they persuaded a great many voters that the old Richard Nixon, the one you wouldn't buy a used car from, was dead. And they produced a television image which concealed Mr. Nixon's temper and twitching hands, stilled his horizontally moving eyes, lightened his tough gray beard, and even made him smile. But above all, they gave him that magic ingredient, believability. And it worked. The product was elected president of the United States. After Watergate, one of Mr. Nixon's image makers had an attack of remorse and honesty. He said, if a politician is given the right image at the right time, he can look out from that TV screen and say nothing, and the schmucks will believe him. Jim Sprouse is not a Nixon, just a hard-working, handshaking local politician with no charisma who wants to be governor of West Virginia. Yes, Jim Sprouse. But Jim Sprouse has a problem. In the language of Madison Avenue, he is a product that doesn't have dramatizable newness. Or rather, he lacks that magic ingredient, believability. <laughs> As a campaign gets uh, closer in, into the election date, you have less and less news coverage because there's so many candidates competing for it. And the uh, news people have a tendency to, to give you a pretty short shrift. Uh, how are you all this morning? Hi, Jim Sprouse. Good hey. to see you. Hi. Joe, how are you this morning, buddy? Hi. Hey, hey, how are you doing? Hey, hello, Joe. Hello, Bobby. <laughs> hey, how you doing? You haven't got a hand to shake. Yeah, Good to yeah, see you. Yeah. It's uh, frustrating to have to sell, like you sell, sold for other commercial products, you know, and you obviously can't get. Uh, any in-depth programs in 30 seconds, 60 second spots. Well, Sprouse was the only honest man in that whole administration. Yeah. Why, why don't you watch this section, too? This is just really roughly put together. No one can deny that within my... So Jim Sprouse needs an image maker, and he has hired one of the best and most expensive in the business, Charles Guggenheim, who helped to change Bobby Kennedy's image from that of a ruthless opportunist to an all-American hero. From literally miles of film, Guggenheim's staff will carve a new, improved Jim Sprouse. Just how important is advertising in winning political campaigns? The political process is an advocacy thing. Just in court, uh, I think you, you place your, your best positions forward and you 
often put aside those things that you do not think will be most helpful to your case. And there's no disguising the fact that the political process is an advocacy process. Is it more difficult to work with a hero like Bobby Kennedy, as you did, or with someone like Jim Sprouse? I think it depends more on the personality than how well known they are. All you had to do is be with Robert Kennedy, as you have, mm -hmm. and see him with people. You knew that he had a tremendous quality for self-effacement, mm -hmm. great sense of humor. Uh, uh, all you had to do is talk to the people who were close to his life, people who, to see him the way he was with children. Mm -hmm. Now, to capture that on film, not to make it, not to create that, that quality in him, it existed in him. But to bring it to people's attention was our job. Doesn't it mean that in the end you can distill it all down to where the politician in that 30 seconds says nothing, so no one knows anything? I think there are terribly unfair things in the American political process, of which political advertising plays a very important part. Uh, I have often said that I think the, the political process in our country is is run more by the advertising agencies than it is by any other group. Now that seems strange to Americans as well as to people abroad, but the truth of the matter is that American people see more of their candidates and learn more about them and the issues in the 30 and 60 second commercials than they do in any other way. After I listen to everything the other Democrats have to say, I keep coming back to Jackson. I pay attention to what other Democrats say about crime and criminals, but I keep coming back to Jackson. They've all got something to say on unemployment, inflation, and of course, busing. But I keep coming back to Jackson. Let's have a president who knows something. Elect Senator Scoop Jackson, while there's still time to save the 70s. Well, if he's going to save the 70s, Scoop Jackson will have to wait till the 80s. Jackson spent a fortune on TV commercials, but got nowhere. His image makers got so desperate that they made sure the candidate was seen only in still pictures and that his voice was never heard. Jackson was simply so boring that no image maker could rescue him from his long march back into well-deserved obscurity. One of those who was paid to save him, New York agency man Harold Pearson, explains. But there must have been something wrong with this product. I mean, the product, Senator Jackson, when you started out on the campaign, what was that? He, he wasn't perfect because in a sense, by virtue of being such a workhorse, uh, he spent all of his time as a legislator and none of his time as a person. And we found that very few people knew about him as a person. Black Eyed Peas, where are they? Everyone knew about him in terms of the things, the, his achievements and his experience. And, but it was a job we had to do to try to get people to know him more as, as a man and uh, not less as a function of his experience, but also as a man. He doesn't smile like Jimmy Carter. Is that a problem? No, I think that's going to turn out to be a great asset. I'm not sure Jimmy Carter can stop smiling right now. I think he's got some sort of a, a physical problem. This man is a farmer. He is also an engineer, a father, a Sunday school teacher, and a former governor. This man is Jimmy Carter, an uncommon man who is now running for the Democratic nomination for president. In this TV commercial, the skillfully edited glimpses of Jimmy Carter are meant only to project a certain style, a kind of calculated inoffensiveness. While Carter's character and politics remain invisible, Carter, unlike Jackson, is allowed to speak in the commercials, but that he really says nothing. Well, you know, everybody from Congress that's running for president is a lawyer. I don't have anything against lawyers. My oldest son uh, is a lawyer. But uh, I think it's time to have a non-lawyer in the White House for a change. To make the facts fit the image, Jimmy Carter's claims about his past are never exactly right. Carter says he was a farmer who worked the soil himself, and in his book he claims to have been a nuclear scientist. In fact, he was a commodities broker, the commodity being peanuts, and an ordinary naval engineer. Perhaps not exactly a lie, but then not exactly the truth either. Jimmy Carter has come a long way since his childhood days in a small town called Plains, Georgia.
There are a lot of things that I would not do to be elected. And I'd like you to listen closely because I mean it. I'll never tell a lie. I'll never make a misleading statement. I'll never betray the confidence that any of you has in me. And I will never avoid a controversial issue. I won't be any better president than I am a candidate. Would you find a candidate like Jimmy Carter a difficult product to handle? I would find him difficult professionally and impossible personally. Um, we're pretty familiar with the things he has done. In our opinion, he is really not a man qualified to hold the office of president. Uh, that is something just a little bit bigger than the governor of Georgia. Uh, we also find that he rarely takes a definitive stand on important issues. He will, may, he will say things like, if the legislature decides to pass the bill, I will sign it. Well, the issue is really whether you'll sign the thing or not. I mean, that, that, that is part of the job. It's his opinion and whether or not he would lead that kind of a fight. He doesn't take those positions. Mr. Nixon had advertising men all around him. Indeed, it seemed that at one time, J. Walter Thompson's was running America and the world. And, and Disneyland. And Disneyland, yeah. right. But look what happened to that product. Um, is, is that not uh, a warning to some of us that uh, perhaps advertising and politicians shouldn't mix? Well, there is no difference uh, between bad advertising people and bad politicians and bad butchers and bad anything. Uh, I think he would have chosen those people, whatever profession they were in. But he was, he was very much promoted. He's, he had image makers, he had advertising sure people pushing the product of Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. That product turned out to be a bit of a, a no-no, didn't it? It did, but everyone throughout the history of this country has had people helping them to campaign in one way or other. Yeah. And they've always been involved with them. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had advertising people helping him, selling him slogans. JFK did. And I don't think they were any worse for wear. In fact, image making only began in the mass media with John Kennedy, whose style the voters knew everything about, while the substance of the man remained largely a mystery. And Jimmy Carter, whose campaign bears an uncanny resemblance to Kennedy's, would surely like to end up with Kennedy's winning image. Uh, I think that big today... In 1960, the Democratic Party estimated that the use of television advertising had made only a few percent of difference in the result of the presidential election. But that was enough to give Kennedy his narrow win over Richard Nixon. This is Jim Sprouse's key to his being elected. Okay, we'll take it off, but um, we're going to have to clean it up later. We can't get this out, can we? Nixon had never really understood the image game, but he learned quickly from Kennedy. Eight years later, he sold himself like soap powder, and he too won with a margin of only a few percent. Once again, Madison Avenue had made all the difference. In most countries, the media have the power to con people. The power might rest in one TV image, one headline, one piece of slick copywriting. In America, the land of the media, that power is now so refined and so pervasive that a politician like Jimmy Carter, the image maker's dream, can be a serious candidate for president without anybody really knowing what he stands for, who he is, why is so popular. But that's the game. The $26 billion Madison Avenue game. Incidentally, it would take just one billion of those dollars to put all the poor farmers in the world on their feet, to make them self-sufficient and independent of our charity. But a billion dollars is actually the amount of money that Americans are expected to spend on fresh and pre-moisturized toilet tissue and on the presidential campaign. Need I say that both products, pre-moisturized toilet tissue and some politicians, have those two magic ingredients, believability and flushability. <laughs>